as cosmologists, there's sort of two ways of looking at the world. And one way is, I guess, essentially the shut up and calculate approach to cosmology, which is we know a bunch of physics and we can calculate things about the system that we believe describes our universe. And we can go and we can look out into the sky and we can make um, you know, deductions on the basis of what we see. On the other hand, we can try and say that the fundamental nature of reality is something perhaps different from, from what we learn in graduate school. And cosmology is possibly the one thing that's, or, or one of the, um, the very small number of things that is going to provide us with information about that. And therefore, we can try and construct sort of ab initio cosmological models and variant theories of physics and see whether or not that leads to a universe that, um, that we have. So another way of thinking about this is, you know, if we have a problem with time, the um, question is, what, you know, what is it that we have to change about cosmology if we've decided that we really do have a problem with time? How do we actually go about fixing that problem? Um, oh, the other thing I should add is that um, it says on the program that I'm currently at Yale that is true. Um, at the end of this year, I'm moving to uh, the University of Auckland. And to the cosmologists in the room, uh, I'd like to point out that I'll be hiring both postdocs and, and recruiting graduate students. So if you have any people who would be interested in living in one of the world's most beautiful cities, please let me know. Uh, also, if you're interested in visiting, please let me know. Um, so what I think I want to talk about is, um, is what is it that as cosmologists, um, now me included, we talk blithely about the first 10 to the minus 35th of a second of the universe. And so one of the things that we want to ask is, well, how close do we really get to this time? In other words, in terms of the way that we actually understand cosmology, you know, when we actually come to observe the universe, we, you know, we say that we observe the, you know, effects that are related to this time, but what do we actually mean when we say that? And I think there's a, one of the things to bear in mind is that there's actually a huge um, kind of theory content of these statements. When we say that we've observed you know, things to do with the first 10 to the minus 36th, 35th of a second of the universe, what we're doing is we're actually making a very, very large hypothesis before we can even really think that statement, much less say it out loud. And so in Bayesian terms, what we're doing is we're assuming a lambda CDM prior when we make that um, statement. And we're assuming that the initial conditions for the universe were set by a fairly um, you know, conventional inflationary scenario. I think it's one of the things that we've learned in the last 30 years is it was, you know, once, at one point must have seemed like a very radical idea when, when Andy was in graduate school, certainly, um, is, is now something that, that, we, that, you know, that we teach our children as if it's a perfectly natural thing for the universe to expand by a, maybe a factor of 10 to the 30 or 10 to the 40, just, um, just a, a, you know, a tiny fraction of the second after the Big Bang. And, and I want to add that in the course of my professional life, in the course of training the graduate students that you're going to send me to come and work at, at, at um, the University of Auckland, um, I, I'm very, very happy to do this. This is, how, this is how I make my living. This is how I pay the mortgage. This is how I feed the kids. Um, and it's also true that the Reverend Bayes and William of Ockham would have got on very well with each other. One of the things we learn when we're testing hypotheses, for instance, is we penalize a hypothesis that seems un unduly baroque or complicated compared to a simpler hypothesis that provides the same, um, same fit to the data. And in the case of inflationary models, much of the emphasis in, in inflationary cosmology is not so much whether or not inflation happened, but which version of inflation actually provides the best you know, detailed fit to the data that we see um, when we or our various proxies, in the case of satellites, uh, uh, look up into the sky. So, this, so there's this kind of schizophrenic approach to physics. You know, one is, is, is that we really don't know anything at all about the true nature of reality. And the other is that we know so much about it that we're completely happy to, 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 to think about physics in, in you know, regimes and domains that are you know, vastly different from, from what we can um, approach with terrestrial experimentation. So as I said, you know, the, the, uh, you know, as a kind of case study of this, now, we like to think, for instance, you know, the standard approach to cosmology is to treat cosmology as applied physics. So we have a large, you know, like any other problem in an applied system, we have a large system that we can describe in some way. And we have some set of physical laws that the universe is, is obliged, or the system the universe is obliged to obey. And so in this sense, you know, everything you need to know to be a cosmologist, or about 90% of what you need to know to be a cosmologist, in some ways is, is embodied in you know, Landau and Lipschitz, you know, the sort of standard um, no, sort of hardcore calculational approach to, to physics that we like to torment our, our graduate students with. And so if you want to learn cosmology, you know, we, we know that, the, for instance, that the very early universe was ionized. And we know that the universe, you know, this is um, no, not in sort of infinite past, but um, we know that during this time that photons couldn't propagate pre, pre, um, freely. You know, the density perturbations um, th that existed in the early universe very naturally um, translate into temperature perturbations simply because the gas of photons and electrons is somewhat denser in those regions. Um, we know that the perturbations necessarily have an, you know, are, are roughly about one part in 10 to the 5 relative 
to the, you know, the, homogene the density of the homogeneous universe before they started to grow um, you know, into galaxies and stars. And we've measured this amplitude of those perturbations to parts of maybe 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3. So in an absolute sense, you know, we've, measured part, we've measured sort of global properties of the universe to maybe parts in a, in a hundred thousand or parts in a million, which, you know, which is you know, better than a part in a million, which is you know, tremendously um, you know, a detailed measurement of any physical system, particularly one as, as large and complicated as the universe. And so what we do, if we want to calculate the properties of this early universe at the time before there were stars and galaxies and there were just you know, um, hydrogen atoms and photons and, and some dark matter, we had turned to you know, very classical physics. We turned to atomic physics. When the microwave background, which I'm going to talk about a little more in a second, was laid down, the universe was, a, was on the order of a few thousand degrees Kelvin. That's you know, a situation that you can very easily create in a laboratory. It's not so easy to create a situation where you have 10, times, um, 10 to the 9 times as many photons as you do hydrogen atoms, but it's certainly one that we can, um, we can describe quite happily um, um, you know, uh, algebraically. We have general relativity, which has been well tested in a number of circumstances. We believe we understand how it behaves. We have a little bit of quantum electrodynamics if we want to get fancy, and we have statistical mechanics in the form of the um, Boltzmann equation. And so we look up, we, you know, we, we launch a satellite, we look up, we, we see the, the W, you know, this is the microwave background sky. I take it, even the biologists in the room are presumably um, sick of this image at this point. So, but this is, you know, this is our C elegance of the, of the, um, of the universe. You know, this is our kind of standard thing that we like to look at when we're thinking about the universe. And the same way that, um, and what we look at is we, you know, if, if I showed you simply the image of the microwave background, it would be perfectly homogeneous. You wouldn't be able to tell a difference between one part and another. What we've done is we've subtracted away the, the absolute value of the microwave background, and all we're showing you here is the, is the, is the variation in um, intensity from one point in, in the sky to the next. And so the way this works, the way we understand this physically, is we say that the universe, to, to a first approximation, if we just look at the kinds of particles that sit inside of it, is basically a box of photons. There's 10 to the 9 photons, it seems, for every hydrogen atom in the universe, and if you take a box of photons and make it bigger, one of the things that happens, and again, I'm not speaking to my physicist colleagues who understand this all too well, is that the number of photons in your box is going to go down by a factor, no, you, it's going to go down by the cube of the size of the box. You've just taken a box of rocks, you've made it bigger, the density is going to be proportional to the volume of the box, and the volume of the box is proportional to the cube of the side. On the other hand, if you have photons in your box and not rocks, as you stretch the side of the box, then the, the wavelength of the photons is kind of locked to the box size, and, there, and it's going to decrease as well. So we know that the frequency of a photon is proportional to its weight, or is, um, the energy of a photon is, is inversely proportional to its wavelength. So as we increase the size of the box, the number of, the, the number of photons in the, um, and the energy of the photons in the box goes down by another factor of the size of the box. So what that tells us, and I'm doing this purely as an example, this tells us that the density of radiation in the box goes like the, 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 the size of the box to the, to the inverse fourth power. But on the other hand, the density of radiation goes like the temperature to the power 4. So what that tells us is that the temperature and the expansion track each other very naturally. And so even though there's 10 to the 9 photons in every cubic meter today, and it may be about one hydrogen atom in a typical cubic meter, this, clearly, this cubic meter here is clearly not a typical cubic meter, it tells us that if we make the universe bigger, um, smaller, it tells us that eventually the amount of energy that's stored in the photons is going to um, become large relative to that in the matter. And we're going to, the very early universe is going to be dominated by the radiation content and not by the matter content. So this allows us to kind of theoretically to form a picture of the universe at very high temperatures. And so another thing I think that's surprising about the universe, but something that people who do cosmology take for granted, is that stars and galaxies, when we look out into the sky, they look like the biggest and most um, substantial things you could imagine in the sky. But all of these things must form. In the very early universe, there was no stars, there were no galaxies. The universe was full um, initially of neutral gas, and when you go back earlier, what you find is, is that, that that gas becomes ionized. So the universe is full of hydrogen and helium, little bits of other things. One of the things we know is if we take a photon that has more than 13.6 electron volts of energy in the units that physicists like to use, and we hit that with a hydrogen atom, it's got enough energy not just to kind of excite the electron, but to actually tear it off the, um, the proton and allow it to go on its own merry way. So once, once you have a large number of photons with this energy, typically the hydrogen in the universe will become ionized. So the average photon energy today is about 2 times 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. So you might think naively, if the universe was 100,000 times smaller, the hydrogen would be ionized. But because there's so many more photons than electrons, um, in, in order to, to get the, from 2 times 10 to the minus 4 to the 13.6, um, 
In order to get, you only actually have to make the universe about a thousand times smaller than it is today, simply because there's so many electrons, you only have to make the most energetic, so many photons, you only have to make the most energetic photon above this 13.6 electron volt limit, and then at that point you, you have a universe that, that, that will become ionized. So this is all stuff that we can teach to, can and do teach our students. It's something that I could explain in detail in a, in a graduate class or in somewhat less detail in an undergraduate class. What I want, the point I want to make is that this is something that's happening at very, very low energies compared to the sort of energy where you'd be doing physics at the, at the LHC. So this is, this is physics that was well understood and has been well understood for 50 or 60 years. So then the problem is, is well, we know when we present pictures of the microwave background, we say that there's a bunch of free parameters that we, measure, that we have to measure in order to, in order to fit the data to the, to the universe that we see. And so in the minimal cosmology, the free parameters that we have to fit are on the first hand the, content, the baryon content of the universe. In other words, what fraction of the universe is made out of, baryon, is made out of, you know, of atoms, essentially. And so we know what the mass of the average baryon is. It's the same as the hydrogen. Um, same in the, all the baryons essentially live in hydrogen or helium atoms. What we don't know is what this is really telling us is why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? In other words, we know that if the, no, with all of the hydrogen we see, all of the helium we see is essentially n none of it is anti-hydrogen, none of it is anti-helium. So something at some point in the early universe must have, made, must, have, must have generated this asymmetry. And this must be some particle physics process that we don't currently understand. And so therefore we assume that it's happening at energies that are larger than the, than, than the, the energies that we have currently probed at accelerated. But the next thing we know is that the universe appears to contain a lot of dark matter. For people, again, who aren't in the field, one of the things that can be shocking about dark matter is, is that dark matter, in fact, is, is something that you know, was originally proposed you know, purely as a hypothesis to explain why the sort of checkbook of astrophysics didn't balance. But in fact, we now have about four or five different independent lines of evidence for the existence of dark matter. And so if you want to explain dark matter as a modified theory of gravity, it turns out you have to modify gravity in about four or five different ways to explain um, you know, each of these things, some, you know, different observations. On the other hand, the simple dark matter hypothesis is enough to tell you that the dark matter is, in fact, you know, that, that is enough to explain all of these observations. And in particular, some of these observations, and one of them in particular I'm going to talk about in a second, were actually, you know, th these are predictions that were made before the observations were actually carried out. So in this sense, dark matter is, is even though we haven't isolated the particular kind of stuff that dark matter is made of, it's a perfectly good and testable theory that makes predictions. And it's very important to realize that those predictions have in fact been checked in some detail and have been verified by observations. Um, the last thing we need is cosmological constant. We don't know where that comes from or why that, why that value has, has what it does. We might assume that it's quantum gravity somehow, but as far as we know, it's basically magic. Then there's a bunch of other numbers we have to tinker with in order to get things to come out. These aren't numbers that relate to fundamental physics. They're just related to the fact that we can't, for instance, calculate the, hist no, the, the, the evolutionary history of stars from first principles. We can't do a kind of, you know, in principle we know how stars work, in practice we can't actually tell you exactly when the first stars turned on. <coughs> Likewise, we don't know exactly when in the, you know, the current age of the universe we're carrying out these observations. If we know that value, then we expect that the universe to change as a function of time, so what we observe is going to be a function of when we look. And lastly, there's a couple of numbers that tell us what the properties of the primordial perturbations are that, that eventually grow into the seeds that um, you know, form the kind of structure that we see in the universe. And so it's these last two numbers that are coming hopefully from inflation or in, you know, conventional models of inflation. When we say that inflation, or when Andy says that inflation can explain why it is that the universe is not only homogeneous but also makes small departures from homogeneity, I'm not going to, I don't need to write down the particular uh, the functional um, ex expression where, the, where these um, parameters appear, but it's these parameters that, that quantify the d departure from homogeneity. Ten minutes, okay, brilliant. Okay, so here's a picture of the microwave background again. This is a, um, I should attribute this image to the WMAP satellite. And so what we love to do with things, and no, what we love to do with the picture as physicists is to take its Fourier transform. And because this thing is basically a circle that we're sitting, or a sphere that we've got our head inside of, we can't take a Fourier transform because that's something that works on a plane, so we reduce things to spherical harmonics. And so what I've plotted here is I've plotted the, um, the so-called multipole moments. So in other words, we're expanding things in terms of ALMs. We don't think the M component, which is telling you something about angular direction, has anything interesting, so we're averaging over that. And this is so that this, this quantity here, the CL, is essentially the, you know, any given CL is the average of the corresponding ALMs that you get when you reduce that map uh, to a sum of spherical harmonics. 
And so this red line that goes through there isn't something we've drawn to, to guide the eye. This is what we get by actually adjusting the parameters that I showed you before in such a way as to give us the best fit to the data that we get um, from, from looking at this guy. And so one of the beautiful things about this is you can see that there's this amazing um, correlation between what we actually see and the particular model that we actually have. So it's telling you in that sense that, no, if this was purely a straight line that we were fitting, there'd be much less we'd be able to do with it. But because we have this beautiful structure here, we're able to um, actually have some confidence that, that, no, that, we're that, that we have some non-trivial agreement between theory and data. And in particular, as I mentioned, these, these acoustic peaks, as they're called, these, um, that are sort of on the right-hand side of this diagram, these would not be there in a universe that did not contain dark matter. So if you took all of the dark matter out of the primordial universe, then you would have, then the red line would look dramatically different from the way that it looks in this picture. The, this, the shape of this picture was calculated before these observations were carried out. And so therefore, you know, when people, so dark matter at least is something that we believe to be, you know, a, a fundamental constituent of the universe. And so anyone who tells you that dark matter is, you know, purely a hypothesis to explain an embarrassing observation, you can show them this argument, uh, this, this diagram, and tell them that's not true. Okay, so this red line here is the version I got from NASA. So I downloaded the raw data, and I plotted the, um, the individual um, uh, you know, quantities here. Because what you saw previously, each of the dots that you saw previously, was a whole bunch of these adjacent points that had been binned and therefore reduced their error bars. So you can see that the actual individual error bar is not um, trivially small. But on the other hand, we can put our red line back, and we can see that it's still um, a very good fit to the data. And on top of that, if we remove all of our residuals, if we remove all our signal and just focus on the residuals, you can see that there's really nothing left over. There's no, no obvious feature here that needs to be explained. So once that what that is telling us is that this very simple kind of shut up and calculate Landau and Lifshitz view of cosmology is actually providing us a remarkably good fit to what we see when we look up into, an, look up in, look up into the sky. We've got these three parameters that would correspond to pieces of particle physics that we don't understand. But on the other hand, um, you know, once we're allowing ourselves those three parameters, then, um, you know, th then we see that we have this amazingly good agreement here. But one of the things that's lost in this picture is that, in fact, we don't understand the universe as well as we think. You know, so the microwave background or the properties of the microwave background are laid down a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. The universe is about 13.7 billion years old, so we think that we understand the universe throughout most of its lifetime. On the other hand, the natural time scale to use when you're thinking about the universe is not so much the, um, the, no, the ticking clock, <coughs> but is in fact the, the, the rate at which the universe is growing, and the universe tends to grow more slowly as it expands. And so what that means is, is that the most, you know, by, by using the ticking clock rather than the expansion of um, history of the universe, you tend to wind up with a, um, you know, with a biased view that we understand sort of 99.9% .9 of the universe, when in fact, as I'm going to argue, we understand about half of it. And so in particular, if we think about this in a sort of roughly logarithmic scale on en of energy, which is you know, proportional to the expansion history of the universe, what we see is that the piece that we actually understand, so in this last little piece to here today, when the typical photon has an energy of maybe 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, this is when we're laying down the structure that we see in the universe when stars and galaxies and clusters of galaxies are forming. This is when it, the point at which the universe becomes dominated by dark energy, in other words, essentially today. The microwave background, um, the picture that we see is essentially fixed in this at this time here when the typical temperature of the a photon is about a tenth of an electron volt. In other words, the universe is about a thousand times smaller than it is today. The universe became matter-dominated only a few expansion times um, before that. The, the one hard thing that we have to hang our hat on is when the temperature of the universe was a little bit less than 10 to the 6 electron volts, or a little bit less than an MeV, the kind of period of primordial nuclear cooking that happens about three minutes after the Big Bang um, took place at that time. And there, again, we have um, you know, calculations that we can do, observations that we can test them against, and we can see good um, agreement between these, these two things. We also see evidence for, the background, for a neutrino background in the universe. In other words, neutrinos that were laid down um, by a particle physics process I don't want to discuss, but we've seen evidence for these things. And at just at a slightly higher temperature, this process would occur at a slightly higher temperature than nuclear synthesis, but not significantly higher. What that means is that this chunk, you know, from about here downwards, we can say that we understand pretty much everything that's going on in the universe because we can test, you know, we can you know, compare the calculations that we perform to specific observations of the universe that we can carry out. This region here, on the other hand, corresponds to chunks of the universe into which we have no direct window if we really want to be hardcore about it and we don't want to make 
any particularly strong um, assumptions about the nature of the, the, no, the overall nature of matter. So what that means is, is that if this region here is in fact a much smaller chunk of the total expansion history of the universe than this region here. So there's a very large piece of the universe that we simply do not have direct experimental probes of. In order to make statements about this piece of the universe here, we also have to make some fairly strong hypothesis about the nature of physics at, at energies above the MeV scale. So for the, <coughs> as we get up to the GeV scale, where the mass of the proton sits, and to the TeV scale, those are places where we do have some direct experimental constraints on particle physics coming from things like the LHC. But once we get up significantly above LHC scales, you can see that we're still only about halfway to the point that we want to identify as the Big Bang. And in that region, we have simply no direct probes of the universe. So when we're talking about that 10 to the minus 35th of a second after the Big Bang, this region in here, the only way we can make that statement is to make a very strong assumption about the way that particle physics works. And I think here, I'm essentially making the same kind of statement that Andy was making, except I think I'm making it in terms of energy rather than in terms of position. And it's simply, we know, in order to make these statements, we have to make a very strong hypothesis. It's a very minimal hypothesis. So from that point of view, you know, Occam's razor has served physics enormously well over the years. So it's not a particularly radical hypothesis. It may actually be the most natural thing to assume. But this region here is essentially unexplored territory as far as physics, um, as physics is concerned. Okay, so above gut scales, or above, um, you know, from gut to MeV scales, that corresponds to a range of about 10 to the 18. The properties of the universe in this region, just to re recapitulate, are essentially unconstrained. So, in, in, you know, if we really want to lay it out, in this region here, above um, TeV scales, this corresponds to a, 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 you know, a range of 10 to the 12 in energy, and it's in this region here that the physics, both of the properties of particle physics and the properties of the universe are, are unknown to us. What I was asked to do was to sort of say something about conventional cosmology. And then to say, well, what is it that we can do if we, you know, if we think that somehow cosmology is betraying some idea of the arrow of time or it has some idea of the arrow of time built into it or has some problem with time, then what is it that we're going to do in order to, in order to make that better? So the issue we have here is that cosmology provides a remarkably good fit to data. So in some sense, we have the same problem that our friends in particle physics will have if they don't discover anything new at the LHC, or worse yet, that they only discover the Higgs at the LHC. What that does is it kind of, re you know, it, it will confirm the most basic model that we have of particle physics, but on the other hand, it won't provide any real clues as to where you might look for some, for some deeper ideas about how things work. So one of the things, the only thing we know is that somehow or other you need to produce a hot universe in time for nuclear synthesis, and also for technical reasons, you also have to have the perturbations that produce stars and galaxies already have to be in place. At that, at that time. But beyond that, you can do pretty much whatever you want. I think it's fair to say that if you want to do anything truly radical, it would be hard to do that below the TV scale, in other words, below the kind of scales that are being probed at the LHC, simply because you'd have to make all of the matter in the universe appear at en by some process that would operate at energies in, you know, at which we have some experimental access. And so doing that would be hard in order to do that without also um, you know, running into conflict with something that we've already measured. On the other hand, above TV scales, it's anyone's guess what, 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 the, um, what the universe is doing. So if we want to modify things, I think the simplest thing we could do is to simply say some, you know, move to some stringy or brain world model. This modifies particle physics, but it also modifies our understanding of space. And the, you know, by modifying the nature of space, it may in fact mod modify our understanding of time. So you may find some, some minimal you know, um, approach to this problem could, could be living in, inside of some stringy model. On the other hand, we could move to some, um, say, a variable speed of light model where we're giving up something that we imagine to be you know, almost sacred as physicists, and we can do this in, in, in ways that change causality. Um, so that may, again, if you change causality, it may also change your understanding of time. Again, Andy Albrecht is the a person who knows more about this than I do. We could give up, and um, we could move to eternal inflation. I think, and, and dif I differ from Andy in the sense that it seems that many models of inflation naturally predict the existence of a kind of multiverse, so we should take that prediction seriously. But what that's telling us in another sense is that the piece of the universe we see is very, very different from the average universe as a whole. So what we're giving up then at that point is the idea that we're performing some representative observation of the universe when we look out into the sky, and in a sense that's also necessarily introducing a large um, dose of anthropics into what we say about the um, cosmology. And finally, I think we could move to some more radical position. And you could argue, for instance, that you know, there are ideas, for instance, you know, holography and fundamental physics that tell us that you can have two very, very radically different descriptions of the same system. 
And so it may be that there's some different description of our universe in which maybe we have different numbers of spatial dimensions in which time plays a less important role. Um, that in some sense from a physics perspective may in fact be a more fundamental or a more clean description of the system that we live in, but somehow the way that our brains or our consciousness are wired causes us to prefer this more complicated description you know, starting from Newton through to the present day. And I think what that's really doing is if we're really wired to observe the, you know, the particular description of, you know, if we have two possible descriptions of the universe, one with time, one in some sense without, then our, our senses seem to be you know, wired in such a way as that we prefer the, the version of the universe that, that, has, um, you know, that has time. And so that then gets us to the point of whether we can really trust our sense experiences when it comes to making sense of the world. And so that, I think, is the most radical solution to this problem, if we assume that there's a problem at all. And finally, I want to close with an image that I saw the other day when I was thinking about this talk. This is at the Castle Nord in the Dordogne in France, and it's a um, particularly large crossbow that was apparently mounted inside of a castle to, um, to harass if, if, um, people nearby. And so whenever, in deference to Paul Davies, whenever I think of Time's Arrow, I always think of the sort of thing that would be shot by one of these. I've, ne I've never thought of it as a compass before. I think that, I think that has to um, possibly betray my lack of imagination in applying um, you know, imagery to the English language, but I've always seen an end with a point and an end with feathers. Um, for this thing, I think you're largely wanting to see the feathery end rather than the pointy end. But on that note, I'll end my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>